Hello, and welcome to the SANS Cloud Ace podcast. Today, I'm really excited to have as our guest, Kapil Asudani, who is the CISO at Edwards Life Sciences. And I'm especially excited because hey, Kapil and I used to work together at Kaiser Permanente as well. Kapil, thanks so much for joining. Absolutely. Pleasure uh, being here, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you know what? Let's go ahead and dive right in. And as we like to do on these episodes, I like to start with a little bit of personal background. So can you share a little bit about your personal and family history and if at all that influenced your choice of career? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, um, you know, I was born and brought up in India and, you know, a typical what we call a middle income family. My dad was, uh, you know, the only breadwinner in the family. And I have two siblings, so three kids. He was catering to education and upkeep of three kids, uh, you know, being the single bread uh, winner in the family. And, you know, in India, you're competing against 1.2 billion people. So it's survival of the fittest, you know, it, it's how it kind of works. And, you know, growing up for me, it was since the beginning, it was always like, if there is a rule, how I can bypass that rule? You know, I was one of those notorious kids, you know, where parents were called in every parents teacher meeting part of things because I was looking to bypass things as always, which is why I'm in cyber today kind of thing. Right. Um, but that's kind of you know, in, in a nutshell, you know, my background and my family where I come from overall, but, you know, it definitely put in some very good resiliency skills, you know, how to make things happen, be very competitive and, you know, all of those aspects that come in, you know, growing up in India, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to hear that, you know, as a kid, you know, you don't necessarily, or I didn't anyways, necessarily think about those things. It's only in retrospect that I say, oh yeah, those personal experiences, you know, hey, they've got pros and cons, right? And makes you more resilient and, you know, uh, resourceful and, and things like that, like you yeah. said. Now, um, you mentioned growing up in India. What what city or what region were you in? Oh, it's in capital Delhi, New Delhi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because Delhi is the only place uh, in India that I have visited. I would like to go back and go see other places, but I've only been to Delhi. <laughs> nice, nice. Go to the mountains, Himalayas. Every city there is beautiful. That's my favorite part, yeah. Ah, very cool. Now, yeah, so you mentioned kind of the uh, maybe the approach that you took even as a young person and maybe naturally that helped you get into cybersecurity. But, you know, from a career perspective, you know, kind of, hey, did you always know you want to get into security? What did you study in school? And then, you know, how did you start in cyber? Right. So, so you know, coming into U.S. was more, you know, for my academic aspect of doing master's in computer science. You know, I got a very good opportunity to do that. Um, and I came at a very shoestring budget. I basically had money to pay for my first semester. And after that, I didn't know what I'll do. Somehow I'll figure something out. And But I won't ask money from my dad because he's already paid for my bachelor's. So the goal was, you know, my master's and graduate program, I have to fund myself. And if I can, I'll go back to India kind of thing. And it really got very tight in the sense I was doing research assistantship at Sprint with, uh, with my professor. And he was supposed to get some funding by uh, second semester, but he didn't. And, you know, it almost got to a point where, you know, I got my third red slip of your fees are not paid. And the good news came that he got the funding and everything was, you know, amazing after that, basically. But for me, it was very important that I do this independently, you know, part of things. Now, how I got into cyber was, you know, it was 2003, right? You know, still the Y2K effect was going on, you know, when I was finishing my master's and it was very hard to get, get a job. So it was a Bruce Force attack in a Midwest city in Kansas City where I applied to 120 companies, like literally, you know, across the board and see how many I hear back from kind of thing. And, you know, I got an internship in a company where I was asked to install Windows operating system in all the hospitals. And this is something I'm doing after my master's uh, in computer <laughs> science and scoring, you know, amazing grades and whatnot. But I saw that as an opportunity because they had one of the best cybersecurity, you know, security operation center, um, uh, you know, part of things. And that's what I was eyeing. I was like, if I go into this work, I will network with people there, show them my knowledge. They'll be impressed and hopefully I can get in and start to learn and get into the cybersecurity career. And it worked out that way because they became my colleagues as a part of my internships. Uh, and I started sharing what I'm doing in my master's as a minor in cybersecurity, sharing my you know projects and accomplishments. And as soon as my internship finished, I you know finished my last semester and I was hired there into their uh, security operations center program. And that's uh, how I kind of 
got into it because it, it was just like in, in masters when i did the cybersecurity courses for me it was like you get paid to think bad and 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 ethically that it's like a win-win situation so uh that's kind of where i started you know overall that's amazing, you know, and I know Kansas City, there's a lot of uh, healthcare in Kansas City and, you know, you've been at a number of healthcare organizations throughout your career. Where, yeah. where, what company was that in Kansas City? So it was a managed service provider. It's called Alexander Open Systems. And so it was pretty much the SOC for almost all of Midwest. Um, so I, my first job was a graveyard shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., where I was the only person in the office uh, <laughs> kind of thing. But it also turned out to be the best school for me, you know, uh, trying to learn all the cybersecurity techniques because that's what I am looking and monitoring for. So it would, became literally essential for me to master those techniques part of things. And that's when I started jumping into Ernst Young, where it was Advanced Security Center, the, the hacking team uh, that hired me. and you know, there was no looking back after that. Yeah. Wow. So when you were at the uh, managed service provider, you know, when those CEOs testify after a big breach, they say, oh, it was the one person who didn't uh, answer the <laughs> alert. So you were that one person then. Yes, I was that one person. The, the, the scapegoat was ready, but thankfully uh, that chance didn't come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned you went from there to, to ENY. And, you know, I know ENY and I've uh, worked with a number of the folks there over the years. And uh, you, I think you said the Advanced uh, Security Center, which a lot of good people and a lot of great work came out of there. So when you joined, what did you uh, start doing there? So it was uh, doing ethical hacking for Fortune 100 companies. And it used to be, a, it basically brought back the resiliency, you know, that I had built back in India, you know, competing with 1.2 billion people kind of aspect. Um, you know, absolutely bunch of super smart people there. Um, you know, I would say I was, I was the least knowledgeable in them and which was, I thought was a very favorable thing to be, you know, part of because anything and everything I can learn, be a sponge there, part of things and was very competitive. You know, if we go do an ethical hacking engagement at a client, all of my colleagues are like, you know, hey, today is Tuesday and you still didn't get a domain admin, you know, Wednesday, <laughs> you still didn't get a, so, you know, working in that pressure environment with like super sharp people, learning from them and everything, you know, it, it was just, uh, you know, absolutely amazing, yeah, experience to be there, yeah. That's very cool. Now, how many years were you at ENY and then where'd you go next? So I was in ENY little over two years, and then I went to Semantic Professional Services, where I was a principal of, again, ethical hacking team. So I was there. And then that's my consulting career. And after that, I moved into corporate side of things because I was seeing more and more. I wasn't getting the satisfaction of, you know, seeing a problem all the way through its solution. You know, it was more like, you know, I identify a bunch of problems and I think I'm cool and then I move on to the next, but I don't see how it was remediated, whether my remediation that I gave to them worked or not, you know, and those kind of things. So that's kind of, I kind of, you know, uh, turned around and it's like, you know, I want to be there with the problem, solve it and, you know, get the sense of accomplishment out of it, basically, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's funny because, you know, most of my career, I would say, let's say 80% has been spent in uh, large enterprises, you know, big companies, and right. you know, always having to deal with what you just described of, uh, you know, having to see something from the beginning to the end and all of the bureaucratic and process and struggles along the way. So now after working for some decades, you know, I want to go to the consulting, you know, right. to the consulting side, right? Versus, yeah, um, yeah. It, it was a big learning experience. You know, I thought breaking was cool and hard, but once I went into the builder side of security, you know, it's, it's way, way more harder and higher learning curve to become a good architect, like a good security architect. And, you know, because breaking time, I just have to find one, you know, problem that some non-security person has made, which they will make because they are not security savvy. But being on the other side of the house, you have to cover basis for every IT person or every employee that's in the company, because one screw up they have, you know, you're responsible for, uh, you know, how defense in depth uh, security principles you have followed, basically, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, breaking things is definitely fun, but you're right about, uh, hey, it's uh, much harder to do everything else correctly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so from Semantic, I think you went to uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Is that right? That is correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And then, so what did that, if you can think back, you know, what did that program look like at the time when you started? And then what did it look like when you left? Because you were there for some number of years, right? 
Yeah, I was there for quite a few years because now I was actually solving problems and I didn't want to quit in between, you know, to get the next best, best hot job or, or, you know, make a big jump in my salary because the sense of ownership became, you know, an order of magnitude higher. It's like, I am here, I'm here to make a change and the change is not going to happen in six months, one year, two years kind of thing, right? And um, well, I had really good set of leaders. Um, you know, somehow I've been very fortunate uh, in terms of uh, the people I've reported to, and I've learned a lot from them in all diverse ways. You know, at some place I'm learning technical skills, other places I'm learning, you know, how to be structured and, you know, how to do, you know, very structured problem decomposition and those kind of things. You, you know, so this was the company where I was working for people who were very structured, very thorough, very detail oriented. You know, even the documentation we'll do, you know, even grammatical problems, you know, would not be taken lightly kind of thing, you know, so that allowed, you know, to to really focus in on, you know, quality aspect of things. How do you think about a problem? How do you think about it in a tactical way, in a strategic way? And how do you apply when to be tactical, when to be strategic, you know, part of things. But yeah, this was my foray into the builder side of security, you know, working as a principal security architect first. And then, uh, you know, going on to leading a team of, you know, security builder practices, basically, on security architecture, security implementation, you know, and detection and response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then from there, uh, you went to uh, Kaiser, where we met, right, uh, building out the uh, architecture, the security architecture program there. And I, I got to see, you know, thankfully, firsthand the level of uh, dedication and diligence and expertise that you brought to, you know, uh, bring, putting that program together. So that was uh, that was great. Yeah. Yeah, and Kaiser, I call a country, not a company, because it's uh, 300,000 employees. We're very, very, again, you know, a brand new, amazing set of experience to be, uh, you know, doing security at that scale. And uh, you were yet another amazing leader uh, being my boss. So it was, you know, cannot forget those times. Absolutely. Hey, you're, you're, too, you're too kind, but that's not why I invited <laughs> you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, so after Kaiser, you know, that gets us, I think, to the present day. You know, you've been the CISO at Edwards Life Sciences for six years now. And, uh, you know, speaking of a big company, you know, that's a $45 billion company. You know, I think, what, 17 plus thousand employees, if I uh, if I have the numbers correct. And, you know, that was uh, six years ago. And I, I think that was, uh, you know, in the early days of the, the cloud journey and uh, the transformation technologically. And I think I'm sure the security program has changed a lot since you first started. So, you know, you built both the security program and the cloud capabilities at Edwards, you know, kind of yeah, walk us through what that looked like from the beginning, your approach as a leader, building the program and those capabilities. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I was brought in to pretty much build a security program from scratch because it had been tried in the last five years in many different ways. The security program was distributed then centralized then distributed again. They were trying a lot of different things, but somehow it wasn't working. And so me coming in, uh, you know, the goal was, you know, my CFO basically told me this, you're here and if 30 days pass by and I don't see you, it's a problem. So that's kind of the visibility, you know, he wanted into the program because he understood that, you know, there's no time to, you know, cater around in this space basically, right? And before I even joined the job, you know, there was a commitment he made that, you know, I would have the backing, you know, I told him I'm not coming in to fill a, C-level role, I'm coming in to make a change and what kind of support I'll get. And that was the assurance I was given, you know, and, and you know, me making that decision. So I think like, you know, I go back to always, you know, the basics, you know, in terms of building a, a cybersecurity program, you know, for a company, you know, as any leader, it's not even specific to cybersecurity. As any leader, first, you have to be able to build credibility you know, to make any ask. So for me, you know, before I make any ask, I want to be able to first show execution with what I have. It's not like it's zero dollars and you're, just, you're starting from scratch doesn't mean there's zero dollars. The starting from scratch also means what you have today, how can you repurpose this to show, you know, effectiveness and execution and driving the program forward. People look at that, you know, they observe you and they see the credibility, they see there's a dent in, you know, the security posture to be in a positive way kind of thing. And then that credibility gives you more money, more money gives you the right set, you know, ability to hire the right set of people and, you know, and advance the program forward. So basically my deal with the CFO was, I won't ask you anything for eight months. I think eight months, I have enough money to be repurposed and do things 
and you know i want visibility for every execution i'm doing to the elt so that everybody gets to see that so you have to think of i have hired a leader ask, asking for no money but showing results basically and so within nine months i was pretty much you know introduced to the entire executive leadership team you know multiple times on all the things that we were solving and how i was not even asking for anything extra and making just giving them updates on here was how bad the problem is and it's completely solved here is another problem this was a situation solved and giving them examples because they don't understand cyber right so the examples like you know we would take you know in terms of a very well-rounded problem oriented approach was like this is what the industry is doing about this this is how the prob bad the problem is here here's how many companies have already been breached because of this problem uh, and then it will be a, literally a slide bar are we going to so we have three choices are we going to do nothing about it are we going to do something about it or are we going to solve the problem it literally getting the audience to a point it's like you know they almost feel embarrassed that you know how, how can i not do anything about this with this kind of data so you know re really being very data and fact based approach and really bringing down the problem you know in a very simple manner where two business leaders are talking you know and and making a decision i, I think that was that was key i would say in the beginning the whole focus was you know really looking at the processes and streamlining them for example cyber arc of the world you know it, it can do nothing if i have 50 or 80 domain admin accounts you know what what would cyber arc do basically so the goal was how can i streamline these processes you know there were 80 domain admin accounts and i said until i get it to single digits i'm not even going to think about deploying the tool basically because it's it's useless right so things of that nature you know how can i focus on attack surface reduction because hackers are not waiting for me to build the most mature security program uh, you know doing information security policy documentation first then doing something else then you know i have to first reduce the attack surface so that i've built a nice shell around me so that i get more time to do things you know to tune the program from inside basically so so pretty much from day one attack surface reduction was just one track that was always on always evergreen until even the basic things were solved kind of things so it was just bulletproofing at least from from outside in perspective um so yeah these are like kind of different approaches you know in, in building the program yeah that's a great example of building credibility and really kind of building that relationship with your uh, fellow executive leaders and certainly, hey, it helps to have the senior executive support from the beginning. But hey, you didn't let that go to waste. You didn't let that opportunity go to waste. You know, you kind of went above and beyond. So that is a uh, very cool in terms of not asking for anything up front and telling them and showing them what you could do and add value along the way. How right. much, um, you know, given you know Edwards, you know, being in kind of the healthcare space, but you know, it's different from an insurance provider and healthcare provider, right? How much did that prior healthcare insurance uh, experience? Kind of help to inform understanding uh the business quicker or was it the consulting experience that helped with that yeah it was a mix of all of that i think uh, being on the hospital side with kaiser we were the customers of medical devices now i'm going to a medical device company so i am telling and educating the you know product team that this is what the hospitals and the providers are expecting out of our devices so if we you know i used to educate them on that there was you know we built in kaiser like you know a, a 15 page questionnaire on vetting a medical device whether it is secure or not so showing that that questionnaire and this is what the expectation is you know created a lot of awareness around security part of thing on product side for example on the normal enterprise aspect of things was mix of all the experience from consulting to kaiser you know those are the regular aspect of things something new for me coming into here was uh manufacturing plant security and mm -hmm. it was fascinating that's not an experience i had in the past or in my consulting experience so that's something we kind of started thinking from scratch you know and that was the exciting challenging part for me so one area good experience and being a salesperson another area you know typical enterprise security part of things that comes natural to you and then third was very challenging manufacturing plant part, plant mm -hmm. part so it was a good mix of things and you know it's like three companies in one when you work for a company that has this kind of uh you know problem space basically mm -hmm. yeah now you mentioned the attack surface reduction which is you know very cool because you can easily tie that and tell the senior leadership 
kind of a story about how this impacts various business, maybe processes or assets, maybe even the manufacturing processes. Kind of how did you, what did you do to implement that attack surface uh, reduction? So yeah, we, we would literally, I would call it to, in today's language, we were not using this language, we calling it sprints basically. So we would literally take, you know, all the aspects on, you know, where is our attack surface exposed? If my, if my patching is not good, what can I do for all internet facing patching aspect of things? You know, literally getting it to a point where we do three scans on our outside perimeter every day. And then anything that comes out, a port open or protocol open, you know, you know, everybody hands on deck and you close it out kind of thing. So this is like a quick example around that. I have 80 domain admin accounts. That's attack surface. You know, if anybody even gets a phishing attack and they compromise their account, domain admin accounts will be hanging out everywhere. So what can I do to get it to single digit part of things, right? Another big attack surface reduction part of things. You know, we, assuming users are going to be compromised with phishing, what's the second part I can fix basically, right? You know, in, in reconnaissance internally. So again, another attack surface part of things. So these, we built a huge list of these things and it was like knocking it off, putting teams behind it and just going one after another in an incremental manner while the parallel track was here are the programs i'm going to build out from a security perspective you know in terms of putting in the right capabilities behind the processes behind you know putting the right people in and that kind of aspect mm -hmm. amazing now i think while you're doing all of that there's a bunch of cloud changes happening as well what did the footprint of cloud look like when you when you started and what does it look like now so you know we had a cio that i still thank him till today he's retired he's gone uh you know enjoying his retirement at this point of time but he was one of those people who basically gave a nine months timeline to the entire it and he said you have nine months to move all your data center workloads into clouds and on this day the ninth month 31st or whatever the 30th would be of that month he will unplug all the applications that have not been moved and the application owner will be answerable to business saying, why did you not move it? And why do I not have my app working kind of thing? And he really made that move, you know? And although at that time it was scary because, you know, we, we literally, you know, lifted and shifted things. And from a security standpoint, it's, you know, absolutely, you know, scary because now your attack surface has gone through the roof part of things, you know? So what can you do? I don't have my, uh, people in the team who have already are cloud savvy. They've been working in physical data center forever kind of thing. But, you know, fast forward it to last two years when we have been in cloud for already six, seven years, you know, our security operational overhead is much, much less than people who are still hanging out and, you know, paralysis analysis decision on, you know, half one leg in cloud and one leg in physical data center. And we are able to, do cloud in cloud ways, basically part of things, both from IT and security standpoint. But you know that journey wasn't easy. It was uh, pretty hard in the first couple of years, like you know, to, to because the tax surface was unknown. I would say because I didn't have the right skill sets in the team, not ready for it, right? And uh, and much more widespread because now everything is in cloud, so it comes with its own you know um, obvious things that we all know of as security professionals. So yeah. Wow, that uh, CIO was very forward looking because, uh, you know, we take cloud maybe now today for granted a little bit. Uh, every organization, government agencies and so on are are naturally in the cloud. But yeah, six or seven years ago, enterprises were still struggling. They're like, should we, should we not move to the cloud? Right. They, were, they were scared. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You, you yeah, so, yeah. yeah so for company of our scale to be 98%, I don't say 100% because you still have some closets that you can't get rid of part of things. Um, you know, to be seven, eight years back to be 98% in cloud, that was a big, big achievement, you know, and really brought down the cost of IT, you know, in the subsequent years, which nobody understood at that time for such a drastic move. But, you know, that that's how transformations happen, yeah. So when that shift first started, you know, you mentioned, you know, hey, the, you didn't necessarily have the expertise on the team. So how did, how did you get your team up to speed in cloud security, especially in those early days? Well, you find it uh, very humorous. Uh, yeah, literally, the, the good part about AWS or you know or Azure and everything is is it's a very well documented and publicly available you know literature that you have around this. And I literally had my team who had no cloud savviness. 
to literally pick up these checklists, you know, that we had, what are the top 10 reasons clouds get, uh, clouds, uh, you know, uh, instances get compromised, you know, S3 buckets getting exposed, you know, like the whole list. And we would literally cater to those lists. We would be like, just basically hitting darts, you know, in a structured way through the documentation part of things. Uh, second is obviously getting people starting to get people certified in uh, in the cloud security space, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, again, you know, having the same philosophy of attack surface reduction, you know, streamlining your processes of provisioning, deprovisionings, you know, all of those bread and butter things, those don't change. So it, we were still not doing cloud security in cloud ways. We were doing cloud security in data center ways. But that was, you know, what, what was required and and had to be happening imminently, you know, in in that aspect and where we were. But over a period of time, you know, we ran into different, uh, you know, candidates we hired for cloud security roles who contributed, you know, in some different ways. And you know, now we are at a point where we have literally rock star people who are helping us, you know, in our cloud security space. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. Am I am I remembering correctly that at some point you even would sit down side by side with your analysts and engineers and kind of go through the cloud APIs and the documentation and so on? Yeah, it, it was uh, literally becoming a professor. You know, while I'm dealing with executive leadership team, I was also uh, you know working with my team on very technical aspects. And it's because I love technology. You know, I I don't think I would ever lose no matter being in this C level role how many times you know it the technology will be at at at, uh, at my heart so uh, that's something i still do enjoy with my team uh, working together and thankfully uh, you know we've been able to build a team that of very very passionate passionate and good hearted people and after that if you have the recipe of these two attributes you know the, learning something new is is easy basically yeah mhm mm yeah now you mentioned the lift and shift and maybe not taking full advantage of the cloud, maybe in terms of automation and infrastructure as code and maybe an API driven approach. Kind of how long did it take to, you know, cause I've been through a couple lift and shift initiatives and it wasn't uh, pretty, right? I mean, things worked, but right. it wasn't pretty. How long did it take to make that transition into a more modern approach? All right, no, a good question, Frank. So the, the, the whole strategic aspect was you know, what kind of a team do I want to build? Do I want a security team that is more operator kind, or do I want to have a security team that is more builder kind? And and since we were a 98%, you know, cloud company in such early years, you know, the need was to get more builder kind of people in, in place, because otherwise we will always be having a very high learning curve because, you know, a tool at the end of the day is still a tool. Like you need to have smart people to work over it. And so the crowd that we kind of build in our team was, you know, very builder mindset kind of a crowd, um, you know, very, you know, you know, script savvy, being able to script different things, being able to automate, having that mindset. You know, there were there were some of the people who were not even security background, but had a very good software development background. And so we hired literally a, a person who had no security background and all he did was software development and his whole role was just doing automation, basically. And then people caught on to his automation. They started learning. We started to build redundancy into our team in that way. And, and then that's kind of how the journey you know, ensued, basically. Mm, very cool. So we, maybe you were one of the uh, places where that somebody like that wound up uh, building dozens of different Lambda functions to automate different aspects of things? It was Lambda functions, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, as a, since you've taken this kind of engineering first approach, now as time progresses, have you seen that what you might have built in house has been maybe superseded or replaced by off the shelf solutions as well? Yeah, so you know we, we did run into quite a few bumps, like I said, you know, and the bumps were if somebody is leaving the organization, you know, then you know what that's the biggest cost or the technical debt you have when you run a builder engineering uh, focused organization because if you don't have redundancy, then you're kind of stuck basically, you know, part of things. But because our focus was like even though people were in different domains but had that builder mindset we were able to repurpose people into building that redundancy you know uh, part of things and so it helped with that aspect and we didn't do a lot of open source kind of thing it was more integrating things in an automated way basically if that makes sense right mm -hmm. you know so so like our soar platform it required a lot of development work but you know 
because somebody else also had a very good developer mindset, they were able to quickly pick up on that and, and start to do things also, right? So, you know, and and that allowed us to be very fast because, you know, being very use case driven of what am I going to do next kind of thing, you know, and, and doing it in a backlog kind of way allows you to, you know, build the whole automation piece, you know, very, very fast and very, very easily. And, and people enjoy that aspect, you know, who are builders at heart kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there, there was, in the beginning, I didn't have any builders and, you know, Carbon Black used to be the best EDR solution, for example. But I, I did not in make an investment because I did not have a builder team. I had an operator team. And it, it's something, they, it's a vehicle they won't be able to drive, even though it was awesome at that time kind of thing, right? So at that time, we bought a tool that would, just do the job and you press the keys and you know it will it will guard you and shield you for you know for some uh, amount of time and then you have architects who are building processes for defense in depth so it's all like you know which situation you are in and how you decide on things you know as soon as it became a builder team you know our investment strategy changed around things you know so uh, kind of you know being creative around that aspect you know sensing and the context of the ecosystem and and driving it and how you're forward thinking, you know, in, in where you're taking your organization to basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny that you mentioned the EDR example, because in the very early, early days of EDR, I joined this one organization and, uh, you know, they had a pretty advanced EDR solution for the time, uh, but the, the team could not take full advantage of it because they were just overwhelmed by what it, the information it was giving and didn't know how to take full advantage uh, right. because, you know, it wasn't a, a mature sock at the time. So yeah, you definitely have to take your current capabilities into account. Absolutely. Right. Hey, what do you, in terms, if we think about kind of cloud overall, you know, what do you kind of maybe, are there things that you're more excited by or things that you think are challenging in the cloud space, whether it's new capabilities, tools, techniques that your team is planning for? So I think like I, I would use the buzzword, you know, AI, you <laughs> know, I think it's both exciting and, uh, and challenging at the same time, right? You know, when it comes to, you know, kind of the challenges that AI poses, you know, fr from the perspective, like, you know, we are a manufacturing plant, we have a supply chain, uh, manufacturing plant based company, and we have a supply chain and everything. And our business is looking for, you know, doing things like Amazon, you know, when you go to your Amazon shopping cart, as soon as you put something in the sh shopping cart, the whole automation piece, uh, you know, piece works in the back end in such a way that the piece is already picked by the robot. It's already on the conveyor belt, even though you haven't committed to it. It's already moving in the conveyor belt and you have not checked out kind of thing, right? And so, you know, with AI coming in, our business is looking to go that Amazon kind of route. But what, what happens because of that is like, you're taking myriad of processes that were manual and siloed before, and now you have stitched them all together you know, with the use of AI, right? And and with power comes responsibility from a security standpoint. If one small thing goes wrong, just everything in the supply chain, you know, will come to a standstill part of things, you know? So, so that's the scary part, you know, because it's a very, very powerful tool. And, you know, somehow there used to be security by obscurity when processes were manual and siloed in supply chain, because even if one gets, you know, has an incident, you're not breaking the whole supply chain, you know, aspect of things, right? But when they all get stitched together and automated and SLAs become the new SLAs, you know, everything tomorrow morning kind of thing, you know, then security has to play a very, very important role, you know, uh, part of things. So I think that's the challenging part. The, the exciting part of AI is like, you know, what can we do with AI, right? You know, like the space of anomaly detection, basically. I feel like, that's a big one because, you know, in cloud, like identity, you know, access management is a big problem. You know, you have hundreds of accounts that have been developed, you know, over the creation of the cloud in your company. And now you're looking at them and, you know, even the administrators are not, not sure if I, you know, remove this account, what will happen basically kind of thing. So I think AI could contribute a lot into this basically, you know, let's say, for example, fingerprint the activity of these accounts. And then, then we know what is being used a lot, what is not being used a lot, what could be consolidated, what could not be consolidated. All of this can be done with the power of AI, for example. Um, so that's the exciting part, basically. I think like, um, you know, 
other exciting or, or challenging aspects like you know i think like from a cloud perspective what i'm excited about is you know different siloed cloud security tools are starting to consolidate into a platform now you know i think that's pretty cool because for every tiny bit of cloud you know security issues we used to have one tool or you know and then we have 20 tools trying to do this but i think the industry has realized this and moving towards very mature consolidated platforms that allow you to be insightful on on the kind of things you see because it has the context of the entire you know landscape there and from protection detection response perspective and because it has that insightful aspect you know the needle in the haystack problem is not there because now when it is a problem we know it is a problem kind of when it shows up so those kind of things other things that excite me i'm seeing the trend in capabilities and tool is a lot of vendors have started to use visualization you know in identity access tools management tools in data security tools where literally you see something as a topography of you know all identities in the incident and you're able to look at it you know it incident in incident identification and be able to investigate it faster so that's a big trend i'm looking at you know all of the vendors have started to pick on uh, which is really really helpful you know at the end of the day but i think the challenge part i i feel like the whole aspect of baselining you know on a behavioral aspect basis and you know be able to do anomaly detection on that you know i think that's the space is still untapped and there's a lot of potential for us you know to work on and and make the tools smart basically mm -hmm. kind of along these lines yeah yeah no that's great it's great great response the let's go back and start with the ai you know just like with cloud you know you advised your team to start to learn cloud in a certain way how are you advising your team to get familiar with ai large language models and where are you, where are you suggesting that they start yeah it, it's it's you know in in the technology stack that we have had so far, uh, there are elements of AI in pretty much all of them because vendors are already thinking about it, basically, right? So, you know, if we are able to leverage the capability of those tools or the automation that we are putting in place, you know, from that aspect, I think that's where the win will be overall. You know, even in the selection of vendors, we're looking at, you know, which which ones are more smarter there email security behemoths who have been there forever and you know they didn't get onto this bandwagon yet you know even when we are in the middle of it basically you know and and so in last 18 months we've already transformed 75 percent of our technology stack just because of what we are seeing because of ai in terms of attacks and everything right so you know i, I don't think it's even a choice for the team to you know, overlook this is it is they are dealing with it basically from an attack standpoint. So they have to start thinking from a defend defending standpoint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, that's interesting. When you say uh, the seventy five percent of the stack has changed a little bit, you mean because of new new product features or new approaches that you're incorporating? So evolving threat landscape. Uh, you know, we get generative AI based attacks. You know, to the point like, for example, our open enrollment for insurance mm -hmm. starts in august pretty much every company's open enrollment starts in january and we get phishing attacks that come in august about open mm -hmm. enrollment tricking our users like it has become that contextual basically and it's all because you know if our employees have sent an email to a company that has been breached then all the emails that they received are thrown into a ai bot that goes through it and then looks at the domains they, the emails are from and then sends those back. I mean, this is how smart things are. So we, we, we cannot be in, in a traditional email security platform, for example, right? Like, you know, threat intelligence in my in our security detection and response, I don't I don't see threat intelligence being a separate feed and security detection, you know, incidents coming in as, as a separate feed. You know, it, it doesn't work. It has to be together. You know, if I'm grabbing a log my threat intelligence should come out you know as i ingest the log you know and to be able to say that this is a bad ip or this is an okay ip it has to start at the source if we have to be really fast you know in our response so looking at these kind of criteria you know which companies are thinking about this and implementing this you know it just warranted that that change and uh, so it's you know maturity in the vendor space you know evolving threat landscape needs that we are seeing 
uh, you know, otherwise it become operationally very taxing on us to try to take these kind of attacks, uh, you know, from a detection response perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely makes sense in that in that space. Now, what about from a kind of business application functionality? Are you seeing any of that in terms of kind of the LLM application architecture, the corresponding tool chain, just like we had to figure out DevSecOps and, you know, even before Gen AI got big, there was uh, MLOps and MLSecOps. Right. You know, uh, what are you seeing in that area in terms of kind of how security needs to work in terms of kind of building those models and securing those models based on your proprietary right. data that's maybe being used to fine tune them? I mean, let, let's start with uh, Microsoft Copilot. You know, it, everybody gets swept away, blown away with what you see the power of Copilot is, you know, but I, I get amazed too. And, and it's scary at the same point, you know, it, if you have SharePoint as a cloud instance, you know, that you use for, you know, document collaboration in your teams, you know, I, I don't think any company has their permission model in SharePoint, you know, uh, tied to the button kind of thing, basically. And if Copilot is going to exist in this ecosystem, imagine if a, a SharePoint file folder, you know, is not protected and has, doesn't have the right permissions, which nobody manages. It's a delegated uh, access model in SharePoint the co-pilot was going to be able to search through the most sensitive documents and reveal sensitive data to employees, not outside, but still like, you know, if you have PII, it could come out in, you know, uh, in inadvertent ways, basically, you know, in, in our, uh, you know, business clinical trials, you know, process streamlining, you know, there's an aspect where we interview the patients, for example, in terms of how their clinical trial is going. So their LLM models are, company, uh, you know, employees, data science team is building where you could automatically transcribe the entire, you know, call, and then you could summarize it on certain attributes, basically, and, and it'll do all of that job, which now saves hours and hours of, you know, uh, work for them, basically. So I think like for us, you know, right now, we're taking it in a very structured, regimented way of how we are opening things up. We're op in, in Edwards, we're we're not allowing non-sanctioned generative AI tools. And, you know, CAD is already out of the bag. So we can only block, you know, AI aspects that are obvious. Like, you know, if I want to block BARD, I can block it as a URL. But if frankkim.com has a BARD module inside it that you, you built out, you know, it, it's not going to be blocked. So, so our goal is prevent non-sanctioned applications AI-based as much as we can but still empower our employees with generative AI, you know, functionality and um, everything around, around machine learning through corporate or, you know, through enterprise licensed tools like Copilot, like Salesforce has a module for it, you know. So we're putting these amazing tools in the hands of employees, but not in a very open and ad hoc way. We have to have a very streamlined, you know, we have crazy amount of intellectual property. Edward spends 17% of our revenue in, in uh, R&D. So our, our uh, IP is for products that we're going to come out eight, 10 years from now. So we have to be careful. So we're taking baby steps. We're not, you know, uh, kind of just opening it up and come have a party around, you know, AI kind of thing. But you can do a lot with the LLM models that can stay offline and you can still capitalize on the awesomeness of them. And that's how the clinical trial one, you know, when, once we worked with them, you know, they were thinking they could never use it. They could actually use it because it's not connecting out to the internet. So yeah, it's like depending on situation, but baby steps towards it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny how the, uh, the journey is similar across any new technology, you know, mobile was similar. People are scared. We need to not restrict its use. Cloud was a similar thing. And now we see the same thing with the right. AI. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, our goal and messaging to the company is always, we, we will not leave you devoid of any tools. We will just get you the right tools in hand. You can achieve the same purpose, you know, because if we go in a draconian way, people find ways to do other things. So how can I empower them with something that is of, you know, same, you know, use and capability to them without, you know, them lure, lure towards unsanctioned tools kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, and Kapil, that empowering type of approach is exactly why you have a more than above average CISO tenure. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's for many reasons. I mean, Edwards is a company that's growing. I mean, I joined when it was 9,000 employee company. We are 19,000 now. 
And by 2028, we'll be doubling in size to a $10, $11 billion company, you know, from a revenue perspective and 60 to 70 billion from market cap. So the, the challenges are just absolutely amazing. It's like every year I'm looking for some new company with same people, you know, overall. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm great. I'm happy to see all of your success there and, you know, continued uh, success and interesting uh, things to work on. So that's great. The uh, Hey, with that, you know, appreciate all this conversation, but uh, let's go ahead and switch gears and move on to the uh, reverso round where we uh, turn the tables here and let you ask me any question that oh, you want. I was waiting for this one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Frank, you have a really decorated career and very diverse. Like you come from a software development background, you know, kind of going into information security and leading what I call uh, Kaiser Permanente, like the, the country kind of level of company. Uh, you know, different information security programs to being, uh, you know, a, a very, very well-known, renowned, you know, a faculty at SANS where you've impacted probably, you know, thousands of lives in, in coaching and mentoring them, right? So I always wonder what's next for you? Like, what, what is the next exciting thing you're looking in in, uh, in your life uh, to do next? Yeah. Man, Kapil, you are, you are too kind. You know, now, uh, man, I, I got to plan ahead. Now I know who's going to deliver my eulogy <laughs> here. That's, that's very <laughs> nice of you. That's, uh, that's very kind. So yeah, thank you so much. But uh, in terms of uh, what's next, you know, that's uh, one thing, you know, I don't necessarily know. I didn't know that I was going to get into technology after graduating from uh, school. Um, I just happened to get lucky and, uh, you know, graduate around the dot-com boom before the bust happened. And that's when uh, technology and pr uh, development programming engineering jobs were falling off trees. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, to be honest, not the maybe most skilled uh, engineer, skilled, most skilled developer, but it was kind of the right time at the right place. And, you know, I was always trying to learn more. I remember reading uh, Java programming books all weekend long and trying to figure out what the, what the changes were between Java 1, 1.0, 1 and 1.1, 1, 1, 1, and 1.2, and, and so on. And, you know, just always having that kind of desire to, to want to learn more and kind of that, uh, that curiosity. And, uh, you know, I, I can't necessarily say what it's going to be. I do know that it's going to be something where I'm going to continue to learn. You know, um, a number of years ago, you know, I think somebody else, had, you know, I mentioned this to somebody not too long ago. But a number of years ago, I had an interview for a, a different CISO role. You know, that didn't wind up working out. But I remember the person interviewing me, the CEO was like, hey, so, you know, five years from now, the typical question, what do you want to be doing? And, um, you know, I thought, you know, it took me a while to figure it out and, and even verbalize it, because when you're in it, you know, I don't yeah. necessarily know. Um, but I realized that, hey, at that point, I'd been working, you know, uh, almost a couple decades right now. I've been, you know, over 25 years kind of in the in the industry. And, uh, you know, I realized that, hey, I didn't want to stay in kind of operational leadership role forever. Uh, you know, I wanted to kind of see what else there is. And so you mentioned the sand stuff and just being able to, you know, be with people in the classroom. And, you know, it's not just me teaching them, but learning from them as well. Um, but also getting more involved in the startup space and the venture capital space, but still in security. You know, I know it's going to be something where I continue to, to keep on learning. So right. yeah, I don't have a specific answer, but you know that's going to be the thing. You know, I know you know a lot of friends, family members who've gone on and retired. They don't really retire, right? They just kind right. of continue their interests in in other ways. Right. So, yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, Kapil. What about you? What do you think the future holds? Uh, for me personally, um, I, I I want to do something that is technology, security, and giving back to the society kind of thing, and you know, what can we do with AI? What can we do with blockchain to solve, you know, problems in, let's say, homelessness, you know, uh, in in real estate, you know, in, in terms of uh, countries that are, you know, poor or in the developing stage that have the most appetite to take on technology, you know, how could these aspects, you know, really empower them in a positive way, basically? I, I think, like, I think about this as, how could you do charity not in a socialist way but in a capitalist way basically mm. because mm. because socialist way attracts average or below average people because you're not paying them and if you get average below average people you, you you're not going to solve fundamental life you know problems so how could you attract the best of the best in the industry to solve fundamental you know life human problems and use these technologies to to make it happen, basically. So uh, you know, there's some ideas in my head that, that I'm noodling and working on, but nothing concrete that's come out. But I know that this is 
somewhere I want to be basically because it involves cybersecurity, it involves technology, and it involves the giving back aspect of things. And uh, so somewhere in, in that intersection, yeah. I really like how you describe that is whether it be in, uh, if, even if it's not in security, do you know of any examples where somebody or an entity organization has been able to kind of marry that kind of capitalist and socialist approach? No, so not in capitalist and socialist approach. That's something that I am brewing the ideas on. But, you know, in terms of crypto worlds, you know, all of the different, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies, how they're using blockchain to help, uh, you know, let's say housing in, uh, you know, countries in Africa. There's like very well published, you know, uh, you know, white papers on this and there are actual projects that are happening, you know, and and the appetite there is so much because they have nothing today. So for them to adopt something very modern is very easy versus when we're in the US, the most developed country in the world, we already have processes in place. And there's a lot of political aspects of why we can't displace them because th their people have their own interest in certain things to be a certain way. Because if you take the innovation in technology into that space, they won't make money. But those are not the problems in these countries. So how could we demonstrate that model there and, you know, in turn help people, you know, improve their lifestyle, you know, standard of living and everything. So, you know, something along that uh, is how I would kind of put it basically. Oh, well, that's amazing. Hey, on that uh, positive note, let's go ahead and uh, wrap it up. You know, you always want to end the uh, end the session on a good note. So we'll <laughs> go ahead and leave it on that inspiring note. Kapil, I want to thank you so much for uh, joining and sharing your experience and thoughts with us. Oh, it's always a pleasure talking to you, Frank. You know, I remember uh, our beer days uh, when we used to have philosophical conversation in bars. So, you know, absolutely love talking to you always. Yeah. Thank Appreciate you for having yeah. me. Yeah, my pleasure. Great to catch up again. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers.